This is TechSnap, episode 356. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We recorded this episode on February 13th, 2018. It's brought to you by DigitalOcean, IX Systems, and Ting. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is the presenter, the sysadmin, and the teacher. It's Mr. Payne, Mr. Wes Payne. Hello, Wes. Hello, Chris. Hello, Wes. We have a whole docket of stories to get into today. Uh, let's start with our warm-up story, though. There appears to be a nasty security bug inside of Skype, and there's no fix, at least in the short term. It's a flaw in Skype's updating process, which can allow an attacker to gain system-level access. Yeah, surprise, surprise. It's really a privilege escalation bug, isn't it? Yeah, with an appropriately vulnerable Skype process running an update, you can go from an unprivileged user all the way up to the magical system account. So in theory, the attackers are taking advantage of something called the DLL hijacking technique. What's that, Wes? DLL hijacking is a technique where you basically manipulate some offerings from the OS for controlling how DLLs load. Um, You can think of this as somewhat similar to the LD preload trick, if you've ever had to do that while building software on Linux uh, or, or a Unix system. Here, a user space process is able to write a file with a similar name that's going to be used by a process, something like uxtheme.dll. And they're, they're, they put it here in a temporary folder, but somewhere that's on the path and is going to get looked up when the system is resolving DLLs. And so in some cases, it will find that DLL before finding the real system version under System32 or, or something like that. Now that gives an opportunity for that code to get executed. Where this really breaks down is that Skype spins up a separate update process t- to update itself, this is then vulnerable to the DLL hijacking. Unless I'm wrong, it seems like this library hijacking technique would really kind of work on Mac and Linux too, if you had the paths right and you had the right, you know, you just shifted your attack technique for for Mac or for Linux. It's not necessarily inherently a Windows problem. Very much so. But it looks like in the case of the bug we're talking about today, security researchers were trying it out on Windows. They've been working with Microsoft since September to resolve the issue. And the company told the researchers that they've been able to reproduce the issue but a fix will land a newer version of the product rather than issuing a security update because it just involves fundamental reworking of how they remotely update Skype. You know, I can I can understand them being a little wary of this. Auto-updating is definitely something you don't want to break and then have to try to inform users that they need to go, you know, do some sort of manual intervention. That's not really something that's not the target of Skype's audience is, is really able, going to be able to do. But this is an unfortunate vulnerability. You know, I'm not a big Windows desktop user these days, but it seems to me that a lot of applications use a second executable to do their update. So this is probably a wider issue than Skype. It's just simply that Skype offers you the mechanism to send the user the library, right? It's a chat system as well as a system that has to auto-update. We should note that this can be particularly dangerous just because of the privilege escalation involved. A normal non-administrator user account can be used to gain system-level access, especially from a common program like Skype that's not usually something you know thought of as a large security risk. Well, speaking of messaging applications that can send DLLs back and forth to end users, Telegram has a zero-day vulnerability. Well, at least they did. It was first discovered back in October of 2017. Yeah, we've known about this since October, but some interesting new research has just revealed that there really, you know, there were some some wide scale attacks in the real world. Yeah, so Kaspersky Labs did some research here and they primarily focused on the Windows client. However, I don't know if any of this is really specific to Windows. Um, It's more about how operating systems interpret characters, right? In this case, they're using a special non-printable character that's known as the right-to-left override, which, as it sounds like, is used to reverse the order of the characters that come after that character appears in a string. In Unicode, that's U plus 202E. Oh, okay. For all those Unicode fans out there. (laughs) I guess that's uh, legitimately used in Arabic. Exactly. Okay. In particular, this is often used to mislead users. So they'll be prompted with one thing, but because of the confusing nature of the text, it may not have the complete name. It may be shown off screen or pushed beyond the text text area's boundaries or just have false information. Yeah, like in this case, uh, the attackers would make it appear as if they were sending the user a PNG file. And so Telegram would, instead of embedding the image in the Telegram chat, it would say, hey, here's a PNG file to download to view. Would you like to download this? But in reality, they were really sneaking in a JavaScript file. 
Now, both on the Mac and on Windows and on other systems, the user does have to have some interaction here. So they will double click on the file. And in the case of Windows, they'll say, hey, are you sure you want to run this? And the end user had to click that run box. You've all seen this on a Windows system where this dialog comes up and says the publisher could not be verified. Are you sure you want to run this software? Well, what do end users always do? They click run. Yeah, right. Your friend just sent you this cool PNG. You want to check it out. Now, if they're successful, the aim of this attack is to take control of the victim victim systems, and they do it in sort of a two-part process, at least, where they, you know, they get some initial control, study the system, and then add a bunch of additional modules depending on what sort of system they've found. The first stage involves a downloader that's sent to the target. It's written in .NET and uses the Telegram API as the command protocol. So this really is a, you know, while not relying directly on a fault in Telegram, it is a very Telegram-centric attack. Once it's launched, it modifies certain startup registry keys to make sure that it's persistent and copies its executable file into a couple directories, depending on the environment. So now it's got its hooks in the system, and then every two seconds it starts to check for commands arriving from the control bot. Here they note that the commands are implemented in Russian. Oh, this is our first real indication of perhaps who the attacker is, right? And note this is coming from Kaspersky Labs, too. What's interesting is that they've also provided a list of the commands available from the from the botnet, you know, things like installing backdoors, loggers, or other malware, or oh. just, you know, listing the directories in control. Oh, good. I love that. That's nice. <laughs> Actually, this post, if you want to check it out, go to techsnap.systems slash 356. And uh, they, they go through a bunch of different scripts here that they've looked at. So there's lots of different variations from JavaScript files to batch script files. And they get, an, they get an idea of some of the different activity the attackers were engaged in. And it's a real shocker, Wes, what they're trying to pull off. Real shocker. Yeah, you guessed it. Mining that crypto coin. Got to get that Monero. You certainly do. So, you know, of course, once they have control of your system, once they can run executables, they just ship over some mining software, start it up, you know, make sure that it's set to send to a wallet they control. And uh, there you go. You're an, you're an illicit participant in their mining operation. One of the things that they did to try to keep things under the radar is they used common sounding Windows program names to hide their crypto miners. So, for example, a popular miner was taskmgn.exe. It looks like task manager, but it's missing some of the letters. Ooh. But if you saw that in your process list, you might not, especially if you're not a Windows or, or even just as someone, you know, yeah, who hasn't user. used Windows in a while. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there were some batch scripts that have extra features, things that would disable Windows security, uh, maybe log the user into a malicious FTP server and download additional payloads, you know, nice little convenient things like that. And one particularly bad example, not only install the crypto miner, but also a remote manipulator system a.k.a. something like TeamViewer. So, you know, if you need to make sure that your miner's doing well, you want to be able to remote into the system. But is this really a vulnerability in Telegram, or is it more a vulnerability in the host operating system and the way it's interpreting these characters? That's really what it is. Telegram's the delivery system, right? That's what it seems like in this case. Now, there may be steps that Telegram can take to sort of combat this, but of course you do want to support internationalization. They have users in in many countries and languages, so it's a fine line to walk. I think they did some sort of update to Telegram in November of 2017. So just to reset the timeline for you, people were getting exploited in March of 2017. In November of 2017, Telegram developers pushed out an update that seems to alleviate this problem. But they sort of have this is not our problem kind of attitude about it. So it's about as far as they're willing to go. So let me ask you this, Wes. Isn't the real issue here that operating system vendors like Apple and Microsoft just need to simply redesign these warning dialog boxes about running executable code that is unknown? And it's it, it, it appears that simply signing stuff and then saying this is signed or not ha- is insufficient because end users just blow right through those dialog boxes. They click OK or they click Run and they launch the code as if the dialog box never came up. To me... This is a user interface design issue. Yeah, it's a complicated issue. You know, obviously you want to make it easy for users. And a lot of times the people designing these don't necessarily have the same purview or understanding of the system, right? So it's the the difficult part is actually getting the user to understand the context of right. their actions, right? So am I having trouble just running an app that I downloaded? Or am I like, or is this dialogue not at all related to opening a PNG file? I don't know how exactly they can do that. But in today's world... Ain't nobody running JS files that they downloaded from the internet by hand, right? So, so there maybe there can be some steps in between where you're, you know, if you jump through some hoops, you're still allowed to execute whatever you want as an admin user. But for regular users, something a little more clear. 
techsnap.ting.com. It's just a smarter way to do mobile. It's simple. Your average Ting bill is around $24 per month per line. Yeah. Really, it's pay for what you use wireless. Just however much you talk, however many texts you send, and however much data you use, that's what you pay for. It's $6 a month for the line. They got nationwide coverage, no contracts, no service, quote unquote, agreements. You're in total control the entire time. You can see your usage at a glance with their great dashboard and take complete control over your devices, turn individual functions and services off, or disable the entire line, or activate a phone all through their web interface. And if a great dashboard wasn't enough, they've stocked their customer support department full of great people that are ready to answer your questions whenever you need help. It's gonna blow you away the kind of customer service you can get from Ting. And from a technical standpoint, one of my favorite aspects is they have a CDMA and a GSM network. You pick whatever works better in your area and that means you can bring a ton of more devices over. And then you just get $25 in service credit applied to your account when you go to techsnap.ting.com. It's a better way to do mobile. Go grab a device from them or bring your own. techsnap.ting.com. Cisco is back in the news this week, but not because of a vulnerability, but because a vulnerability they discovered turned out to be much worse than they originally understood. And it turns out the original fix that they've already shipped out was incomplete. If you're not already familiar, there's been a recent vulnerability in the XML parser of Cisco's adaptive security appliance. Yeah, the ASA, as they call it. And it could allow an unauthenticated remote attacker to cause a reload of the affected system or to remotely execute code. So this has been a pretty huge vulnerability this, this past couple of weeks. The vulnerability itself is due to an issue with allocating and freeing memory when processing a malicious XML payload. So attackers could exploit this vulnerability by sending a specially crafted XML packet to a vulnerable interface on an affected system. The exploit would then allow the attacker to execute arbitrary code and obtain full control of the system cause a reload of the affected device, or stop processing or incoming VPN authentication requests. Oh, so you can so, either control yeah. it... Or do a denial or, of service. Exactly. Hmm. Now, to be vulnerable, the ASA must have secure socket layer services or Ica v2 remote access VPN services enabled on that interface. Uh, but this is a common use case for these sorts of appliances. So there have been plenty of vulnerable machines. Yeah, I bet there are. And the part that I find to be fascinating about this story was it's a one-two punch. So they initially did an advisory on January 29th. Then they had to revise the advisory on February 7th of 2018 because they have, they realized there was additional issues and that their original patch didn't solve the problem, which is super embarrassing because Cisco is really all about like quality, right? They're supposed to be about like enterprise grade quality. Yeah, it's so, a large part of their reputation. Yeah, this double dip update is is not exactly well received by system administrators. And those of you that are dealing with like your Cisco maintenance and licensing, these kinds of updates can be super frustrating. Now, with that said, there are some ways you can check your own rigs right now to see if they're vulnerable to this. Yeah, you can run show ASP table socket pipe include SSL or DTLS and look for an SSL or a DTLS listen socket on any TCP port. Uh, if either socket is present in the output and you've enabled one of those two features that we were talking about, the device is considered vulnerable. Now, Cisco says technically there's no workarounds, I mean, of, other than patching, there's no workarounds that you can do to your system really because of the range of vulnerabilities. Initially, they thought, well, turn this off, turn this service off, and you're fine. Now they've updated the security announcement to say, okay, turns out there's no workaround, but there is maybe a way you can mitigate some of the risk. Yeah, and that's changing management access to be only allowed from certain restricted known trusted hosts. So if you can live with that restriction, definitely a good thing to do. Those of you running Cisco gear, the thing to be aware of is that today, as we record, Ars Technica has posted a story saying this is being exploited in the wild, and in Cisco's publication of this vulnerability, they clearly state that they are aware that there is public knowledge of this vulnerability and they recommend you patch as soon as possible. Look, the TechSnap program understands nobody likes patching their network infrastructure, but in this particular case, we recommend you patch your shit. Do.co slash snap digitalocean.com. Go over there, create an account, and then use our promo code SNAPOcean to get a $10 credit. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up a server on their very fast infrastructure as about as fast as you can handle it. Everything is SSDs. They have cloud firewalls where you can set up infrastructure to protect you at their network level. That way the traffic never even hits your droplet. They have private networking, which enables communication between droplets in the same data center. Hello, backups and privacy. 
proxies, and they have new plans that are better priced than ever. Everything is SSD-based, 40 gigabit connections coming to the hypervisors, eight data centers, and growing all over the world. And now they're introducing flexible droplets. For only $15 a month, you can mix and match resources that are most appropriate for your application. And of course, the standard droplets have just gotten even better. My favorite, the three cents an hour, is my go-to system for all of the infrastructure needs I have at Jupiter Broadcasting. Three cents an hour. From effortless administration tools to robust compute storage and networking services with predictable pricing, secure and reliable backend, and easy to scale resources, DigitalOcean is something you've just absolutely got to check out. Use our promo code SNAPOcean or go to do.co slash snap to get a $10 credit. You can play around with the three cents an hour rig for a long time. Try out their $5 a month rig two months for free. It's amazing what you get for such great value. DigitalOcean.com, promo code SNAPOcean. And now for something a little different. Longtime listeners of the TechSnap program may recall the Bitcoin Blaster segment back in, I don't know, 2011, 2012, when I first started getting into cryptocurrencies with Alan. Since 2011, my interest has morphed a bit, and I find that I'm more fascinated about the possible implementations of the blockchain. Well, it turns out I'm not the only one fascinated by the blockchain. Microsoft has been watching blockchain technology, has been doing some evaluations, and they believe that it may be the perfect system to build a decentralized identity system. That's right. They've just announced their embrace of public blockchains, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, for use in these decentralized identity systems. Initially, this support will show up through their Microsoft Authenticator app. What is actually kind of interesting about this story, though, is that Microsoft tried to figure out everything but Bitcoin and Litecoin and Ethereum first. Like they looked at all the different systems and they said after examining decentralized storage systems at a high level and consensus protocols and blockchains and a variety of emerging standards, Microsoft believes that blockchain technology and protocols are the best suited for enabling decentralized IDs. And that's from a post from Microsoft today as we record. Identity is one of the many examples you were just talking about, Chris, of, of things blockchains can be useful for that doesn't really have anything to do with payments or currency. In today's post, they look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin in particular as specific platforms that they find are suitable as foundations for decentralized identities. Yeah, Microsoft calls that DIDs, and you may hear that term more and more. Or a block stack ID, they're still working out the terminology. But Microsoft plans to work with DID methods and implementations, which will follow a specific standard outlined by the W3C Working Group. And I don't know where we'll see this end up going, but I'm actually kind of on board with this. I doubt we'll see this as a mechanism for logging into Windows, but as a mechanism for tracking your online identity, I could totally see this. So what is it about a blockchain that Microsoft seems to be interested in for identity? Well, they write that a blockchain is a good fit for the root of a decentralized identity system. Much like Bitcoin itself, it comes down to removing trust in counterparties. No government or centralized entity has control or could censor, I suppose, the identities of any particular user at the root of a public blockchain. Another thing that interests me is just seeing Microsoft throw their, you know, technical and analytical abilities at this. Uh, in particular, we've seen some problems with existing blockchains in the form of scalability, right? Now, some systems have tried to just change the block size, use that as an approach. Microsoft kind of dismissed that as a, as a realistic idea. And oh. instead, they're championing what they call layer two protocols that run atop public blockchains to help with the scalability. That reminds me of the Lightning Payment Network. Exactly. So Microsoft says the long-term fix for this issue is to layer solutions on top of it and address it at a different layer of the protocol. Yeah, some blockchain communities have tried to just increase the on-chain transaction capacity, e.g. block size increases. Right. But this approach generally degrades the decentralized state of the network, and it can't really meet the, reach the millions of transactions per second the system would generate at world scale. So, yeah. you know, if you don't think about it in the small, if you think about if this is really a successful technology, what kind of scale are we going to need? Yeah, a billion users if you're talking Microsoft. Exactly. You know, this all makes a lot of sense to me, Wes, but the part that doesn't make sense to me is why Microsoft would care. I mean, you're essentially decentralizing Microsoft. You're taking away the dependence from Microsoft. Um, I think it's a good move, and I, I, I would like all things on the internet to be as decentralized as possible, especially my identity. If this is successful, Microsoft will have to build their brand and their company not around monitoring you and spying on your user base, but effectively offering you competitive services. Because once you decentralize something like this, you can't really monitor and spy on all the users of it. 
Yeah, it's an interesting approach. Maybe down the line, they'll you know be able to wash their hands of that business and have a have a simpler model to build their business on. Whenever we talk about long-term cryptocurrency or blockchain technology, I like to ground us with a little bit of this is where we're at today news. So BitGrail, this story was submitted by some guy named Alan Jude. I don't know, never heard of him, but he probably likes BSD. BitGrail lost 170 million U.S. greenbacks worth of nano XRB tokens. Why? Well, the checks for whether or not you had sufficient balance to withdraw were only implemented as client-side JavaScript. So it's early days when it comes to this stuff, but the core blockchain technology, I think, has real potential. We've talked a lot about containers here on the TechSnap program, but the reality is containers won't fix everything, specifically your broken culture. Over in the ACMQ, Bridget Kromhout, who's a principal cloud developer over at Microsoft, really has a great article detailing just why that's true. So I thought we'd just spend a little time here, pick out some of the highlights, go read it for yourself. But uh, I, I couldn't resist touching on some points here. It may be familiar if you work at any sort of large organization or a company going through a quote unquote DevOps transitions. Now, Wes, I thought the containers were the most delightful thing to ever happen. Well, Chris, yeah. I mean, they they certainly are. But it turns out there's more than that in running a complex production service. What? So, spoiler alert, the solutions to many difficulties that seem technical can often be found by examining your interactions with others. So, let's talk about a few things that you might want to know when you're actually dealing with the other people that help run those things. Turns out they're called humans. So, one... Tech is not a panacea. So don't don't get me wrong. Containers are delightful. But let's be real. We're unlikely to solve the vast majority of problems in a given organization via the judicious application of kernel features. <laughs> if you have contention between your ops team and your dev team, you know, maybe you're maybe you're trying to figure out who really where these boundaries are. C groups and namespaces, they're not going to solve all of that. They might give you some tools to put in there that, that you can work with as you redraw lines, but it's not just going to solve it for you. So obviously, development teams love the idea of shipping their dependencies bundled with their apps, imagining limitless portability. I mean, I think we've we've all seen that. You've, you've used things like Docker, and they can be, you know, they can change the way you think about how software works and how it's delivered. Portability, reproducibility, those are the major features, right? Yeah, exactly. Plus, you have platform operators that are, you know, that are happy knowing that they can change the underlying infrastructure. You can upgrade, you know, Kubernetes and the systems that it runs on without affecting what's actually in those containers. Until, well, maybe then you realize that the heavyweight app containers some people are shipping, turns out they've got a full OS inside and no one's looking after that. That's always what's deeply bothered me about most of the containers. Now, some are pretty slim. They're pretty minimal, but some are almost an entire freaking operating system with old libraries and all kinds of things that aren't getting updated on a regular basis that aren't part of your patch management regime. And this may not be a problem, you know, that you in particular have. Maybe you're doing this right. You have lightweight containers with statically linked binaries. You're you're handling credentials the right way. But, it, it, you know, it, it ties back to these themes of ownership and, and having conversations about how it's not just that you offer a platform where containers run. It's a everyone understanding what that means and the best ways to do it and talking about that. Man, I so hear what you're saying. And the thing that strikes me is I can have like the best management tools for my host operating system. You know, I could have the best package manager or I could have the best management orchestration system. But if I'm not watching my containers... Uh, then good tooling goes out the window. Yeah, exactly. There's a great quote in here from Andrew Clay Schaefer, which, who calls the state of any running system continuous partial failure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Another theme I'd like to pick out is that we get very excited about, you know, building new systems, greenfield projects, but legacy things don't go away. And so you may be one team that's really excited to go pursue this microservice containerized serverless future that we seem to be building for ourselves. But probably your business, a large amount of the revenue is still coming from all those horrible monoliths that everyone hates. Whatever slow burning tire fire results from a given IT project, it's a sure bet it will be burned for a good long while. Software is not done until it's decommissioned. Until that point, day one is short, day two lasts until the heat death of the universe. Wow, that is so true. That's such a that's such a true statement. Like you think something's going to be I'll make it, I'll I'll build it, I'll ship it, wash my hands, call it good, but it really it's you never it never stops until you just take it out of production. And I think that goes back to, you know, you can't 
you can't buy DevOps. You can't. It's not some some person that you hire or a tool that you get. It's that everyone involved in these systems actually cares and works together to do the right thing. We talk so much about the tooling, and it's important and it's interesting and it it does empower us. But if you don't have a dialogue about how to implement that, if you don't actually address where ownership is, where those boundaries are, and build relationships so that those con- discussions can t- continue. What you'll end up is you'll you'll have a fleet of microservices that are just as much a pain to manage and deal with as your big large monolith was. And there's a lot of different ways to run production infrastructure. There's a lot of different ways to structure feature teams, development teams, ops teams, embedded. There's all kinds of different ways to do it. And in many cases, there is no one right way. What matters is that those teams have aligned principles that they know how to work and there's clear lines of communication. And so while you're focusing on the tools, don't not focus on tools. Tool, tools are important and great and learn them, but make sure that you have everyone in the discussion who needs to be and that you're having it over some tasty pizza. ixsystems.com slash TechSnap. That's where you go to learn more about a company that's going to build the perfect server for you. If you have storage needs, compute needs, or you need an entire data center worth of equipment, iX Systems has been in this business for years. They'll give you a white glove treatment from their first pre-sales call to years after it's been in your data center. They'll burn systems in before they ship them to you, and one of the best things about iX Systems is their deep bench of experts. The people that work at iX are intimately familiar with the code that will be running on your box. They're driven by open source. And that's why I think businesses like Adobe and the Mozilla Foundation and Twitch and Trend Micro and the FreeBSD Foundation and so many others use iX hardware, including your humble Jupiter Broadcasting. Of course, there's others like NASA and the U.S. Army that have huge data needs, and that's why they turn to iX Systems. Go to iXSystems.com slash TechSnap. There you can grab a white paper that'll help you grease the wheels up the chain in your business to switch your hardware provider over to iX, so that way you can stop messing with the stupid, annoying hardware issues and start building reliable, performant infrastructure. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. This is what I've been looking forward to all episode. Let's have a little fun. Let's talk about sticking a computer inside a Faraday cage, a totally air-gapped computer. Nothing on the network. It's inside Tesla's Faraday cage, and we're extracting information from it using nothing but magnetic fields. Yeah, this is some fascinating new research out of Ben-Gurion University, led by Mordecai Guri. In particular, they were looking at how highly sensitive data could be exfiltrated from air-gapped computers that are also kept in a Faraday cage. And so this would only be, at you know, for very secure information at, at, at top-secret facilities, may not be something that Chris or I are looking at doing anytime soon. But especially in a post-Snowden world, we know these attacks are very real. Yeah, especially when it matters. Yeah, exactly. A Faraday cage is made of conducting material that shields the area inside from external electric fields. So it's used both for, one, preventing fields from being leaked out of that area to expose information, and two, prevent that area from being penetrated by external electric fields and thus influencing whatever electromagnetic equipment you may have inside. Okay. But yet they're still able to monitor the magnetic fields that are coming from the computer, I assume, from the computer's CPU. Yeah, in particular, they're they're studying simply magnetic fields. And so a lot of previous research ha- has relied a lot on, on electromagnetic radiation, which is a combination of an oscillating electric field and magnetic field that are coupled and create a wave-like entity. In this case, we're talking simply about magnetic fields, which are not as constrained by Faraday cages. An example of this is that a compass still works just fine inside a Faraday cage. I don't think the concept of air gapping machine is new to the TechSnap audience. In fact, I would be willing to bet that some of them have needed to air gap systems in the past like I have. But we do have a couple of examples where it really matters and they're all about the air gap. In particular, two of those systems widely used by the United States government are the NSA Net and the Joint Worldwide Intelligence Communications Systems. Both of these are used to store highly classified information and have a ton of rules and procedures designed to keep those air gaps in place. But as we've seen, for example, in 2017, WikiLeaks produced a reference to a hacking tool dubbed Brutal Kangaroo that was used to infiltrate air-gapped environments via USB drives. This brings a smile to my face. This reminds me of years ago, Alan and I talked about acoustical methods that they could use to suss out what the computer was working on. Yeah, they review some of the fascinating prior prior work in these areas. So everything from, from ac- acoustical signals generated by hard drives to electromagnetic waves emanating from display screens. So there's one attack called Soft Tempest, where malicious code encodes information 
over AM signals generated by certain dither pixel patterns on monitors. And so that kind of shows the extent of, of just how clever these things are, all kinds of side channel attacks and other clever ways to leak just a tiny bit of information. Another example from one of the researchers uh, who's published in this paper is called GSMEM, where malware leaks data from air-gapped computers using frequencies in the cellular band that's emitted from memory buses. And then they use a rootkit placed on baseband firmware in a corresponding phone and are able to receive that data. Yeah, that just confirms what everyone has always feared, that the baseband is a attack vector. And the fact that they have rootkits ready to go that can be slipped into the firmware on these basebands and then they can start using these phones for surveillance devices, that doesn't help me sleep at night, Wes. No, it does not. So focusing on the on the parts relevant to this paper, there has been a little research into prior methods of just using magnetic fields. It's not, it's not super common. Uh, in particular, most of that prior work has focused on hard disk drive. So if you do have a computer that has, you know, one of those horrible old spinning rust machines, and there still are a great number of them, but it's becoming less and less common, there have been some techniques developed that can use the magnetic fields generated there to leak information. Now, these have been somewhat limited. Um, most most bugs that you're going to use to receive needed to be like a few centimeters or less from the laptop. And the bit rate is less than a bit per second in many situations. So it's really not ideal. It might work over the long term. The first way they do that is instead of having to rely on a computer having a spinning disk, they focus on the CPU. Now, if you're a computer user, you're probably aware that a computer needs a CPU. It seems like you'd have to be pretty motivated to pull an attack off like this. So how do they do it, Wes? That's a great question. So they're relying on really low frequencies. So frequencies lower than 50 hertz. And in the electromagnetic world, you need a really big antenna to, to generate something like that. But that is not true for just simple magnetic fields. And what's been shown in prior research is that electric fields at that low frequency, they really are, you know, it's easy for them to penetrate thick substances. They can get through metal. They get through Faraday cages. Right. And so the nature of this attack is it does require some malware to be installed on the system. But once they've got that malware, they're able to abuse this magnetic field leakage from the CPU in order to exfiltrate information. So basically, they have the malware set up to generate very careful workloads on CPUs. They've done some investigations on how it all works on multi-core systems and with hyper-threading hyper or not. By interposing different periods of high overloaded CPU activity and then no activity on a particular core, they're able to create magnetic fields that they can then transfer, transfer information across. Two other things I thought that were interesting about this research is they did some feasibility tests. So does this still work when there are other users doing data intensive applications on the machine? Maybe. Or take a server. You could have lots of processes running on a server. Right. Yeah, exactly. Turns out, yes, they are. this technique was still able to be applied. And add to that, they could do it even within a virtual machine. Now, there were some caveats here and there. There was a little more difficulty associated, but all of these are still possible. Thanks for sending your feedback and follow-up to techsnap.systems slash contact. And uh, first of 300 wrote in to say that he listened to our coverage of the Beyond Corp setup that Google has, where they don't have a LAN. Everything is considered remote untrusted. And he says, as someone who's worked at Google and used it firsthand, I really hope this becomes a widely implemented industry standard. When done right, it becomes extremely compelling from a user standpoint. It stays out of my way. And the effect of not having a LAN means I effectively work from anywhere with virtually no limitations. Yeah, it really strikes me as an approach that, you know, it, it is remote first in many ways, whether you're in the office or somewhere else, you still need access to the same resources. And this is just a better trust model and really does take some outside the box thinking to figure this out, plan it and actually implement it. So it's awesome that Google has shared what they've learned. Taylor writes in with our next bit of feedback. He says, I love the show and all the work you guys are doing. It always gets me excited to see a new JB show pop up in my RSS feed. Well, that feels cool. That, he sure does. That's good to hear. He says, I was really interested in the recent config management show that you did recently. Number one, I just wanted to bring to your attention a cool project this isn't one of the big four, i.e. Puppet, Ansible, Chef, and Salt. And it's fully open source. It's called Management, M-G-M-T. We'll have a link in the show notes. And it's created by an ex-Puppet expert who formerly worked at Red Hat. Well, until Ansible came along. It's still relatively early days for the project, but it's interesting because it's a distributed architecture, it's an event-driven design, and it has the ability to execute tasks in parallel rather than sequentially. He says it also uses the language based on Go for writing desired configuration strategies with YAML as a fallback. 
Very nice. And uh, he says, maybe you guys could give it a look. Again, it's called Management MGMT, and we'll have a link in the show notes. Thank you for sending your follow-up and your feedback to techsnap.systems slash contact, going there, filling out our form, and sending it into the show like Dave did. Dave and many, many others wrote in asking about the details of my new super micro free NAS system that we covered last week. Dave writes, Hi Chris, send me over the model of the board you have in your new microserver NAS machine. I've got lots of unused server-grade RAM, which is looking for a new home. Oh. Yeah, that would be good since we only have four gigs. So, wow. Thank you, Dave, so much. And Dave, a lot of people asked. So, the board is a Super Micro X8 DTN Plus board, and it's got uh, four gigabytes of DDR3, which, as you know, is many gigs to less. And the reason why I didn't cover it last week is because... I didn't know if I should fully endorse Unix Surplus or a used Super Micro system. I wanted to put it in production for a couple of weeks. We have been stress testing that system since last week's episode. Like since we finished recording, I went out there and set up some tests. And so far, it's passed all of my expectations. One issue I've run into is I think one fan might be kind of on the outs It's not done yet, but I think it's kind of on the outs just because it sounds off. But that's the only complaint I have for this used super micro system. But for the price of $450, I'm pretty happy. And I think um, we'll we'll soon cover moving over the remaining drives from our FreeNAS Mini into this. I just don't want to overwhelm those of you who don't care about Jupiter Broadcasting's network storage. But Dave, thank you for asking. This has been a fantastic set of feedback, but we'd love to have your comments, ideas, and suggestions. Head on over to techsnap.system slash contact and let us know what you think. That brings us to the end of today's TechSnap program, but don't worry. The show keeps on going at techsnap.systems and techsnap.reddit.com. Yeah, and techsnap.systems slash RSS if you want to just plug our feed into your favorite podcast catcher and techsnap.systems slash 356 if you want all of the links to everything we talked about today. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you right back here next week. 